Okay, so here we go. So um, I'm going to talk today about uh, WebPR and online reputation management. Um, just to set the scene, I thought I'd uh, go to this uh, place on Wikipedia, which you may have heard of, uh, to get a definition of, of PR, because until yesterday I didn't actually know what it was. Um, and apparently it's about managing the flow of information between an organization and its publics. And I think that's quite a cool definition, and it seems to work well with the internet, so I'm sticking with it. But it is kind of different online, and, and let's have a look at how it's different. There's a few things. Firstly, you've got less control um, over what people are saying and, and the message that you want to communicate. And there's far more channels online that, you, that you're dealing with in a traditional PR environment. Here's some of them, and this really is just a, a smattering. Some of them you can do something about and get involved with, some of them you can't, like instant messenger and email. Also, your market has less attention, and unfortunately, they only care about themselves. So this is great. Uh, we are faced with a challenging environment. But the challenges have uh, opportunities and prosperity, and that's what we're here today to discuss. So let's quickly look at blogs, because they're quite important in the whole, uh, in the whole mix. Uh, according to Technorati, there's about 120 million blogs. Bit of a rough number, who really knows what the answer is. A lot of people uh, will say blogging is dead. Um, and Twitter has taken over blogging. Well, Technorati, as of last Thursday, is saying that there's still 200,000 new blogs being created every day. So that doesn't sound very dead to me. Um, if you go to Technorati, you can have a look at certain words that have been mentioned in the last 30 days, and these are a few numbers. So the word kudos has come up 305,000 times in the last 30 days on the bloggers here. Um, the word boycott has come up 153,000 times. The word scam, 253,000 times. So I'm illustrating there that uh, people are talking and there's both good and bad things being said uh, on the blogs. But now why are blogs important? And they're certainly not the be all and end all, but they are very, very important. And, and the main reason is that they dominate the search results. Blogs by their very definition are very search engine friendly. They, um, the, the structure of the blogs, the technical structure, is very easy for search engines to read and, and, and understand. So they do, and they, they visit them very frequently. Also, blogs produce a lot of fresh content, which search engines love. And bloggers tend to link to each other. And search engines love links, and when a site has a lot of links coming to it, it will generally rank really well. So these three factors added together mean that uh, blogs rank well on search engines. To take this a bit deeper, ultimately, if they rank well on search engines and someone types your brand into a search engine, that, those top 10 results almost become a benchmark of the state of your reputation. You could argue the top 20, top 30, but how many of you went past the first page of Google? So, actually, I, 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 maybe I'm, I'm assuming a bit too much. Do you all know what a blog is? No. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Um, so, interesting stat, 1.2 million people search for Delta Airlines every month. And what's interesting about that is it's not you know, cheap flights to New York or something like that, it's the actual brand itself. And 1.2 million people, that's a heck of a lot. So if there was something negative in those top 10 results, it would impact the, the, the Delta brand. Here's an example direct from South Africa. A girl in my office wanted to buy a Nissan, went to Google, typed in buy a Nissan. Blog result, uh, do not go to Simpson Nissan in Takai. Um, and it's number three on Google. So it, the, the, it's reality, this kind of stuff does happen. Uh, here's, ooh, doesn't read very well. Um, but if you type in uh, Sun International Hotel Complaints, uh, the number two, uh, number one and two results are pretty nasty. In fact, the, the second one, which you can't read, says um, it talks about the, the girl's disabled boyfriend and how he had a broken wrist and he was harassed by the security, blah, 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 blah. And um, ask yourself, do people actually go and type this kind of stuff into search engines? Well, I think they do. I'll give you an example in a moment. So, in a nutshell, consumers have a voice that they've never had before. And you know, have any of you heard of TripAdvisor? TripAdvisor is a website where, as a traveler, you can go and leave a, um, a review or recommendation or sometimes a negative comment about a hotel you've been to, an airline you've used, car rental, whatever the case may be. Here's a stat. Um, it's the favorite website for UK users to go to for holiday inspiration. And 88% of those visitors are influenced by the content that they read on the site. So, I was going to go to San Francisco and I wanted to stay at a hotel. I had my credit card out about to book the Surf Motel and I had decided on a whim to go to Google and type in Surf Hotel San Francisco Reviews. TripAdvisor came up number one and two and as you can see, the hotel, well, it sounds pants, doesn't it? Um, so, it's just, uh, it's, say no more, I did not stay in this hotel. 
Einstein found another wonderful establishment with three wires. Um, but they, you know, they lost out on a piece of business purely because of their online reputation. Um, according to Compete, consumer-generated content influences $10 billion a year uh, in online travel. I use travel as an example because it's, it's a very web-savvy industry. It's a, the web is a place people go to to plan, research, and book their trips. So it, it, it influences um, the industry quite heavily. And then you've got things like Twitter. I've known about some of you little geeky types. That's you guys at the back sitting there. Hello, good morning. Um, and that's kind of throwing things into the mix. Uh, it's made things a little more tricky. For those of you that don't know what Twitter is, uh, it's essentially a microblog. I hate that term, but uh, it's the best we've got. Uh, it's a blog where you can only make a post of 140 characters or less. So it's essentially the length of, a, of an SMS plus 20 characters for advertising. Well, that's what the original idea was. I no longer do SMSs, so I'm not sure why it's still 140. Um, but Twitter, your, your homepage kind of looks like that. That's my homepage. Um, I took the screenshot last night. As you can see, my last message says, working on my presentation for PR conference. I'm going to take a screenshot of Twitter, say cheese. And a whole bunch of people came back and were like, cheese. Um, so that's what it looks like. Now, I, I, in that same trip to San Francisco, I went uh, and stayed from the, the, the first hotel, the non surf hotel. Um, I went to stay at the Western St. Francis, which is a, a glorious upmarket establishment. And it's where the, the, the conference that I was attending was being held. So I, I, I went to this hotel, which is far more fancy than I'm used to. And um, I got there, and, and I'm the kind of guy, when you go to a five-star hotel, it's a bit of work. Of course it is. And so I made this little Twitter remark. And, uh, then, and I was at a conference talking about online reputation management. So after having this bit of a Twitter grumble, as Twitterers tend to do, um, it's, it's really seems to be a forum of, of moaning and groaning and making snappy comments, but that's, I guess, what makes it fun. It's like a soap opera. Um, so I went and, and typed in Western St. Francis into Twitter. It turns out I wasn't the only person that was having a negative experience in the hotel. And I thought to myself, imagine if the management of the hotel had just been watching it for this. And imagine I got a call in my room to say, Mr. Stokes, here, your, your internet sucks pants. Uh, how can we help you out? Maybe give you a free X, Y, Z, a little background. I'd uh, say thanks very much, and I'd go and say nice things on Twitter. And just a bit of an opportunity lost, in my opinion. So the question on everyone's minds is how do you tame this wild beast uh, that is the internet from a, from a public relations perspective? Uh, and the, the truth is, bummer, sorry, we don't. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, no, we, we don't, but I've come up with this kind of these three words which make me sound really intelligent, like I've thought about this a lot, and that's to listen, then think, and then engage. And I put the thinking cap of letters, but I think it's really important. A lot of people kind of just jump in uh, and, and tackle the situation, whether proactively or reactively, without much thought. And it is easy to get burnt. There's been numerous instances where particularly PR companies, traditional PR companies, have burnt their clients quite badly by not thinking and not understanding uh, the web community well enough. To give you an example, um, I'll give you two examples, both uh, from Edelman, I hope you're from Edelman here, sorry. Um, biggest PR company in the world, top two, top three, I'm not sure, but they're big. And the first thing they did was, um, the Microsoft is one of their clients, when Microsoft launched Vista, they went and bought 100 of the most expensive notebooks you could buy at the time, which was the Acer Ferrari, especially built for men with small penises. And, um, <laughs> And they loaded Vista onto this and they sent it out for free to 100 bloggers. I mean, what could be a better PR tactic? It's brilliant. Except they didn't realize what they were dealing with. And, and these bloggers, for the most part, felt abused, used, uh, like they were just some marketing tool. And the backlash was quite horrific. In fact, a lot of, a lot of the bloggers, being geeky types, wouldn't use Windows anyway. They just gave the machines away uh, to charity or whatever the case may be. So Microsoft ended up with egg on their face. 